So we are here with a good friend of mine by the name of Clossington. And uh, we've been talking a lot over the past little while. I look at him like the wolf from Pulp Fiction. This is a guy who knows everything there is to know about everything I want to know about. And I got no doubt if I wanted to, I I could get him to get Trump on the horn for the next episode. I'm not going to ask him because that would be beyond the pale for a guest. But I'm here with Clossington. And for those who don't know, you can find Clossington on YouTube. He's got a fantastic YouTube channel full of some great videos. And uh, and you were mentioning just before that you have another project that you're serendipitously launching right around now, if, if you'd like to talk a bit about that. Sure. On November 7th, Old Glory Club on YouTube is going to announce its first its first ever its first ever launch to, to the world. Um, right now, follow Old Glory Club on Substack and subscribe to Old Glory Club on YouTube. Um, on November 7th, we are officially launching our channel and announcing projects for the future. So go follow those. Uh, feel free to follow me or subscribe to me on YouTube and follow me on Telegram. I have a nice... Uh, Nice meme page there. It's uh, it's nice and casual. Um, expect a few more live streams on my main channel this year. So go uh, go follow those. And this is great. And for Old Glory Club on Substack, if people are curious, uh, it's going to have a lot of the people they've heard about on the show uh, right now. We've got Paul Fahrenheit's going to be up there. Charlemagne that a lot of people might know. I believe uh, Radical, is it Radical Liberation? I think he's yeah, Rad involved. Lib. Yeah, Radical Lib. A lot of guys are going to be in there. I'm going to keep my eye on it. I encourage everyone else to as well. And also check out that Telegram. He's got a fantastic Telegram channel. I'm hanging out in there. I'm going back and forth. I'm pissing everyone off. I'm saying a bunch of shit and everyone's politely chuckling at it, which is, you know, after years of doing this, I think people know how to how to give me one every once in a while. Um, so and, and on the topic of the YouTube channel, and this is something that ties into what we're going to talk about today. There is a fantastic video that I had watched on your YouTube channel and people can find it here. It's uh, Nick Land's dark enlightenment and this is a video uh with yourself with uh mr christopher sandbatch who's been on the show before you've got charlemagne you got uber soy and you got the distributist who was also on the show and they're discussing someone that we had discussed on the show previously as well nick land now people might recall that there's a clip of this on our odyssey channel uh we reviewed his book we also reviewed uh curtis yarvin's unqualified reservations but we covered nick land's book fang numena that's his collected writings from 1987 to 2007. It's a pretty big book. Now, I Nick Land, to me, just to give people a bit of background of why I find this interesting, and Clossington, our good friend Clossington, has a lot to say on Nick Land, but he knows way more than me. And I came at the NRX thing, which is Nick Land, which is Mencius Moblog, which is a lot of people, but those are kind of the two main guys. I came at it late, and I came at it from the outside. So there's a lot of people, including Dave, the distributor, who got a lot of videos explaining it to people in very simple terms, what this movement was, what its beliefs were. Um, it's kind of a hodgepodge of different things, but Nick Land's, I always found the most engaging it's very, very dense stuff, and it's he's kind of a controversial figure. Some people love him. Some people used to love him, and now they hate him. Some people never liked him, but like him now. So that's kind of my experience with Nick Land, um, especially his later stuff, where it got very cyberpunky, it got very trippy, and very well. That's almost that's poetic. actually uh, that's actually more mid stage Land. Uh, oh, initially, really? Initially, he was much more of a postmodern philosopher where he well he was a proper marxist at uh, the university of warwick where he led the ccru um i'd say it's a department where he trailblazed all sorts of uh strange and interesting new ideas involving accelerationism xenofeminism um all sorts of very strange and odd uh, philosophical concepts that came from heavy use of drugs and and um, a whole lot of um, 
a lot of wacky shenanigans. But then mid land produced like mid era land produced Fanged Numina. Uh, Fanged Numina is a collection of his essays and interviews and miscellaneous writings from 1987 to, I believe, 2007. Um, so this collection is a sort of tipping point where he, he offers a philosophy of cyberpunk accelerationism with regards to capitalism and technology. And he... It's, it's very interesting the way that he actually frames capitalism in his own sort of new Marxian way. Um, and then you have Late Land, which is the Dark Enlightenment uh, Twitter shit poster that we know and love, where he was, <laughs> he was, he was unceremoniously uh, canceled and uh, kicked out of the University of Warwick, where he paved the way for right accelerationism, uh, the liberation of capital from the means of production, uh, and uh, the concept of exit as a means of getting out of the more hellish elements of modernity and modern life. Now, before we continue, um, uh, was his being exiled from that academic institution, was that related to his writings as far as you know, or do you think it was something else? Was it like the affiliation with the right, maybe? I would say that it's partly I would say that it's partly due to him dabbling in extreme ideas of um, of eugenics, race realism and in the in the most materialist base sort of applications of um, of eugenics in capitalism. Um, it's, I wouldn't say that it's entirely because he flirted with extreme ideas, but I think that might be part of it. It might also be, be a result of the use of so, much, so many drugs and use of crack and <laughs> general belligerence. That's so cool. Um, I like him. So if people want to know more about Nick Land before we continue, anyone who's not familiar with him, they can find him. He's alive right now. He's kicking around at on Twitter at, at outsideness. And he also has a substack called zerophilosophy.substack.com. So if anyone wants to kind of check out what he's up to now and, and kind of sink their teeth into the shit post he side, he's great on Twitter. Sorry, continue. Yeah. So so after he produced a screed known as The Dark Enlightenment, a collection of a, a few blog posts and essays, he fled to, I believe it's Shanghai, where he continues to be a proponent of uh, of Bitcoin and altcoin and all sorts of cryptocurrencies, um, and he also produced a constant supply of memes and and good witticisms on Twitter. He is living a cyberpunk life, doing a lot of crack and going to Shanghai. That that's as close as you could get to like a Blade Runner now. Well, his his catchphrase in his essay Meltdown is Neo-China arrives from the future. <laughs> um, so it, it is actually, and, and he does actually have an essay on the hyperstitial aspects of the construction of Shanghai, but hyperstition isn't, uh, isn't one of the main topics of, thing, of, um, of this particular essay. So we'll see that for another day. That's very good. And, you know, my relationship, so I came in, I guess, at the middle uh, I, they, I think the pivotal essay that everyone talks about, and this was what was the topic of discussion that you were having with with all of our friends, was one called Meltdown. Now, we don't need to jump into that right now, but um, actually, before I continue, let me just mention this. Uh, as we're talking about Nick Land, I'm reminded of a book that is going to be on the episode once this uh, interview airs, uh, George Bataille, uh, the author of The Accur Accursed Share. And I found that fascinating that Nick Land kind of comes from the left in the same way. And in he, the the crucible of his thought process is different than everyone else's. He kind of wanders in to by accident into the right, just like George Fataig sort of wandered into economics. What he was really fascinated with was like fucking 
black magic and human sacrifice and stuff and kind of spun that into an economic theory. And, you know, the more I hear about Nick Land, like the stuff he's really, really fascinated with, it kind of, it just kind of gloms on to philosophy as like a way to traffic that in. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it just sounded true enough to say. Well, it comes from the same sort of, I mean, I know it's it's anachronistic, but it's the same deleuze Guattarian postmodern, neo-Marxism, you know, the sort of strain that Bataille is a, was a forerunner of. Um, Bataille, his works are very compatible with Nick Land. And, ah. and I think Nick Land is sort of, Nick Land's the most, most visible contemporary exponent of of Bataille's work. So um, yeah, it's sort of like at, at the, at the lower strata of their belief system is this fascination and almost love of like insane violence or this belief that at the, beneath everything is this insane. A lot of Marxists have that belief that this almost cynical belief that the core of everything is just chaos and death. I, I mean, I guess so, but I think it's, it's a revolt against what they see as a very bleak and soulless world. Um, like if I was, if I was to give a very Marxist materialist interpretation of what a country like America represents today, they'd say something along the line, like someone in Nick Land's crew would say something along the lines of uh, America is a command economy. Uh, where large corporations and hedge funds gather data and run their risk management Monte Carlo simulations through a few server farms in the middle of the desert. But where actual politics comes in is where a few techno-capital NGOs parse through that data, like the Santa Fe Institute or Rand Corp, and create public policy out of this data. And then proscriptions from the parsing of this data is doled out to public policy NGOs like the Gates Foundation or Blair Institute. And they all meet up at the WEF to hash out what the capitalist uh, server farms in the middle of the desert have to say. And then that that's the base. And then the superstructure, as Marxists say, are the NGOs that prop up grassroots ideologies that manage show politics and fabricate linguistic K-line arguments for public policies, public um, linguistic justifications for public policies, decisions made by capitalists. Um, there's very little God in this, and it's a very cynical way of actually, of actually viewing politics, but it's probably more real than you'd realize. And if you read someone like Land, and you knew the the esoteric links and factoids that he 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 sort of dog whistles in his essays, you'll be able to parse them out. Um, like Meltdown will will reference esoteric MIT lectures that only like a few hundred people have ever heard of, and he'll reference he'll just in passing reference. Um, sociological dichotomies that you know you have to be a sociologist to understand, which makes land something of an obscurantist turnoff. Um, and I had also heard, and I I forget who I was talking to, but this is one of the reasons that uh, someone recommended you specifically discuss this because I when I had read Meltdown. Uh, just because we're using that as an example. So if anyone's listening, they could find this essay by Nick Land called Meltdown. Look it up. They're going to get smacked in the face by a lot of stuff that they probably didn't weren't expecting. Let's just say that. And when I read it, it's exactly what you were saying, a lot of these references. And at first I thought, I this is almost designed to frustrate me. But someone had made the point that this is by design, almost as a filtration mechanism to to get out the people he doesn't want really date spending the time to parse through it. Does that sound accurate? Well, I, I think part of it comes from the general obscurantism of the 1990s philosophy departments. 
like Baudrillard has a very similar way of, you know, flexing his scientific credentials by citing, you know, quantum mechanics or other such sophistry to convey very simple concepts. I think part of it comes from the zeitgeist of the 90s philosophy culture. Um, but another part is like, Nick Land can be a very concise and direct auth author when he actually wants to be. A meltdown is written as though you're speaking it out. Like meltdown is written as if it's slam poetry. Um, <laughs> Like the first third, roughly the first third of Meltdown describes a sort of Cthulhu rising from the depths, you know, capitalism, AI, the singularity. They're this, um, this, it's just this monster that is engulfing the world. And there are, just as in the call of Cthulhu, there are little tiny boats that are getting destroyed along the way, you know, emergent planetary, planetary commercial. Uh, like planetary markets wrecking all sorts of nations and globe wars feeding this gigantic engine. It's very, it's Lovecraftian. And then, yep. the, then the middle third describes contemporary politics in a very, in a very obscurantist kind of way. But if you really parse through it, you understand where the 1990s, was in terms of its discourse where where you have uh think globally act locally leftism uh welfare chauvinism uh on the left juxtaposed to neoconservative expanding markets expanding the freedom um support the the techno capital global yada 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 and then the last third is just pure cyberpunk fiction that has actually come somewhat true in the last few years uh, with the emergence of um, of the transgender complex, industrial complex and, and all sorts of weird, bizarre um, Lovecraftian horrors, uh, abominations beyond science coming out of, of labs all over the, all over the globe. Um, and then he effectively predicts mimetic warfare as a sort of virology towards the end. Um, well, that's interesting. So it is fair to say that Nick Land's you know philosophy, even his writing, is still relevant. It's not just some sort of eccentric flash in the pan. So he, Nick Land, is the sort of philosopher of cyberpunk. And he predicts a cyberpunk future where, like, you've seen, everybody's seen Blade Runner before, but imagine, instead of Blade Runner, you have something much closer to the, the video game, isn't it like Cyberpunk 2077 or whatever That's right, exactly. And there's also one called Shadow Run that's pretty similar, too. Yeah, he predicts a, a future much closer to something like Neuromancer or Cyberpunk 2077 than Blade Runner. Where you know you're swapping body parts and swapping information, you know what is real, what is not, um, all all in service of a sort of gray goo techno capital, whatever. I was going to say the only thing I found because we had uh, covered, I think, very briefly, Neuromancer. Or maybe we didn't. I just read it recently. But one thing that I always felt was kind of locked in that the time and place it was written was their vision of the future always seemed a bit more ANCAP. It seemed a bit more like, yes, you'll have this like technocratic, you know, interplanetary corporations, but then you also you had this sort of substrata of society, a black market where you could kind of do all the cool stuff. And then the lived reality is, oh, we have all the bad stuff, but none of that cool underground, everyone gets a half robot Japanese girlfriend sort of thing. Well, like part of the well, part of the trap that the sort of cyberpunk movement actually fell into was the deleuze Guattarian uh, deter deterritorialization and then re-territorialization, um, where you have uh, rebellion served on a, on a platter as 
infotainment. I think in Meltdown, he actually does, I think it's around his, uh, his screed on uh, new conservatism. It's, um, uh, where is it? Uh, communist iconography has become raw material for the advertising industry and denunciations of the spectacle sell interactive multimedia. You know, it's the classic Che Guevara t-shirt as product. Um, <laughs> but what Nick Land supports is not, or what he proposes is the future, is not ideology. Like he says, ideology bad, strictly speaking. Um, ideology and philosophy in general tends, pr tends to produce... I think he called it uh, like platonic fascist regimes that inevitably fail because of mismanagement. Hmm. Um, so what he supports is sort of, uh, yes, it's a sort of encapistan disintegration of human relations in favor of ready-to-go transactional commercial transactions. He says that that is effectively the future because uh, the biosphere is disintegrating into cyberspace. Um, True. And, and do you think that's accurate as well? Because I think a lot of people would see that bear out in their everyday lives. But I wanted to know from you, like what you think his batting average is for that. Well, it's it's not necessarily it's not necessarily supposed to be commentary for day to day politics. He says that in the future, biological relations, you know, can I trust dimes on this business deal will go away and be replaced with, you know, you, your bank account will transfer a certain amount to my bank account in X number of days, uh, no questions asked. It's a security concern. Uh, and if it was... And if the human race goes extinct, you know, the next species out there, the dolphins, will come to the same conclusions that dolphin-to-dolphin -dolphin interfaces are inferior to computer-to-computer -computer interfaces. Um, so it's, it's much more of a... It's a progressive vision of technology where a civilization or a species that is adequately intelligent will eventually ditch biological pe beings trusting each other with technology running computations. And I think what always struck me as so fascinating about uh, Nick Land was that as I read him discussing this, there was a sense of inevitability. And the closest thing I saw to that in the mainstream uh, was Elon Musk when he was talking about AI. And he was talking about AI with the same sort of gravity of saying of, of truly believing it's inevitable, truly believing we see that future coming and we only need to figure out what to do about it. But and also truly believing that there's no way to stop it. And I guess that that leads to a question I was going to ask is uh, Nick Land often gets billed as an accelerationist. Now. I'm not sure I believe that because when I look at his future, a lot of people who are accelerationists, especially on the right, they their acceleration is to societal collapse, whereas Nick Lands is just let's go to you know full bore to the future. Now, do you think accelerationist is a fair uh, classification for him? Okay, so there are a few different types of accelerationism that have been espoused over the years. Um, there is well, it's spelled like A-C-C, -C, or it's slash A-C-C, -C, but L slash A-C-C, -C, left accelerationism, is, is the instantiation of democratic means of governance applied to technology. So technology as a way of informed consent and better governing uh, there's our AC, right, accelerate, right accelerationism, as um, you know, we can be self-reliant um, 
Bitcoin farmers on a homestead somewhere where all of our property rights are secured on the blockchain. There's that. And then there's the sort of nightmarish UAC, unconditional accelerationism, where Nick Land comes from, where essentially he claims uh, technology is, as a progressive force will advance into a sort of gray goo Borg into the future. It doesn't matter if it's humans or dolphins that do this, but this is the way this is the way civilizations act. Um, the human inter the human security system is going to be replaced. The biocapital human systems will be replaced with with capital with machinic systems. Uh, we we will be outmoded one day, and that the only way to to get into the future or the the way these things develop the way these these technological machinic systems work is an acceleration in the amount of data processed and if civilization collapses due to you know x number of issues you know a meteor strike hits us or uh the IQ shredder shreds all of the bio capital, and we are no longer able to to maintain the machines, and so the machines collapse, and there are no more people to to actually plug in numbers and parse the data at the Santa Fe in Institute. Um, you know, the the only way to advance is to just go forward and to just accelerate things. Democracy is a speed bump to technological, techno-capital progress. And so it has to be overcome. That's a fascinating thing. And before, some people might have gotten just a bit confused there because I don't think we've explained this on the show before, but um, I could we could briefly, shortly explain uh, the concept of an IQ shredder. Um, so this was, uh, as far as I know, a term coined by this, uh, Spandrel. And right, Spandrel, yes. And I think Nick Land talked about it too. So for people, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it's sort of the, the dark side of brain drain. Everyone kind of knows what brain drain well, is. It's the, smartest... it's the oh, dysgenics sorry. of, of, it's the dysgenics of brain drain plus, uh, urban lifestyles or cosmopolitan lifestyles. Uh, it was first put forward by uh, by the blogger Spandrel, but then Nick Land completely fleshed it out and applied accelerationism to it. Um, I could go ahead and explain if you'd like. I, I would actually, yeah. Um, let's do before we go on. That would be good to discuss because it, it's almost like an episode in itself, too. But but go ahead. So, so this is probably the the video I'm most proud of. Uh, IQ shredders. I, I made that video in an afternoon, uh, but IQ Shredder is a term that Spandrel applied to the city-state of Singapore that has a birth rate of roughly, I think it's point a fertility rate of 0.8 or something absurd like that. Uh, but in order to to sustain the markets and actually bring in new talent. It has to drain the rest of Southeast Asia of all of its talent to to fuel its economy. Um, Singapore is a hyper efficient market city, completely undemocratic. It is an oligarchic capitalist, like a venture capital fantasy, um, but it runs on people. It sucks in talent from the hinterlands, and then you can't have many kids in the city. High IQ from surrounding areas that comes in, and then they do not have children. And intelligence is hereditable. Uh, your children will have roughly the same IQ as you. So what happens is it drains the IQ of all the surrounding areas to fuel the markets. Um, and Nick Land says that the only solution to this problem of essentially the West, the West sucks all of the best and brightest out of the rest of the world 
and converts uh, biocapital, you know, biological intelligence into technocapital, into machines, into new algorithms, into better ways of managing the world. So the only way to get the only way for the world to survive draining its high IQ is to convert IQ into machine learning before this genetic spikes hmm. us in the ass in the long run. So it's almost trying just trying to outpace dysgenics is what yes, we're trying it's, to accomplish with AI. Yeah. yeah, it's essentially the fact that uh, like can the machines replace humans before humans become like room temperature IQ morons. Huh. And, and it's interesting with someone like uh, Land who comes from the left, but it seems that once you start taking these topics seriously, it's almost impossible to ignore a eugenics aspect to it. And even if you want to not come at it from a race or ethnicity perspective, because we don't need to go down that road, but it seems that you always hit some kind of uh, roadblock of like, we need to talk about genetics at some point, right? Well, yes. And then you have Nick Land in a sort of lefty uh, kind of academic way condemning any sort of uh, nationalism, any sort of family structure or patriarchal structure, even having relations between family members. Um, really? He's a, he's a Stefan Molyneux, is he? Well, okay, so... <laughs> so Around the middle, or actually around the one-third mark of Meltdown, uh, he describes a rationalized patriarchal genealogy, pseudo-universal sanitary identity, and institutional slavery as you know, politics, inter-cybernized uh, police. Um, essentially, your family is holding you back from becoming the AI overlord or continuing to develop AI overlords. Um, he says that, that these, that these memes, the family, the national identity, um, patriarchy, these come about from the fact that, uh, that humans come from a very low trust society. Like humans are very low trust. You can't necessarily trust your neighbor, but what you can do is you can create an ideology where you can trust your family. Um, he says that that these ideals of a family are are paranoid ideals of self sufficiency. I can. I don't need markets. I can trust my family. You know, I wonder how much of that is still just his leftist priors uh, creeping in, because even if we if let's let's you know project the future where there is some kind of singularity moment and we all become like a gray goo, like could there be within that gray goo? It would just look, you know, uniform and homogenous to a human. But within the context of that gray goo, there is st still some hierarchical battle going on that we just can't do. In, which is to say that he just thinks it's going to be gray goo communism. Well, it's, it's you have very similar claims made by Marx himself. But his, his twist is that humans and families are low trust out of necessity. And so they create, uh, they create these K lines, these, uh, these structures, these uh, problem solution structures to cement over the low trust humans have between each other. But what we don't, what we will have in the future, what we will have in the future are, uh, uh, technological and commercial bonds to replace human, like human peer-to-peer -peer bonds. Um, what he's what he is predicting is something like a um, an Aldous Huxley Brave New World kind of industrialized society being created, but it does. But Brave New World doesn't quite go far enough 
in its alienation of man from his own kin. Uh, he predicts something like, um, like, uh, like humans being reduced to a sort of bacteria or, or, or the um, uh, body with, without organs. It's, it's a very surreal imagery. It, it, well, in a way, it's like a lot of the people on the right broadly are always talking about, you know, building a high trust society, but he's trying to build a post trust society in a way. Where That's actually exactly what it is. Um, you can't trust your neighbor, but you don't have to trust your neighbor. You can trust the bank or you could abstract uh, the relations you need with your neighbor with technology. So that is, um, you don't need, you don't actually need, um, you don't actually need tight communities to manage your social relations. You have social media. You don't need to talk to anyone in a town you're moving to. You can just go onto the internet and see what places there are to rent around town. You don't, you don't need to go to down to downtown to the local bank. You could just go onto the internet and, do all your banking online. Um, I guess that's in a way what a lot of uh, institutions are trying to get going with, in a way, social credit systems and a lot of the stuff that people on the right are generally spooked by. But you kind of do see a centralization happening in a lot of ways. Well, it's, it's making you a more productive node. And it's also reducing the amount of human error that can happen. Um. So that's that's the process of erasing human bonds with capital. I was going to ask, um, you know, I, I've read quite a bit of Nick Land, as have you. Uh, to your knowledge, are there any other contemporaries of Nick Land or anyone else, you know, speaking this language or kind of trying to build this in a different direction, this area, ideology or area of thought? I mean, you, you ask that, but you have to be in the right they, they don't talk about it as philosophy. They talk about it as public policy in Silicon Valley. Like if you actually go and listen to Santa Fe Institute lectures, you'll hear essentially the philosophy of Nick Land um, being espoused by Silicon Valley techno-capitalists. Could you speak to that a little bit? This is just the first time I, I'd heard of the Santa Fe Institute for anyone else who's as uh, boneheaded as me. No, I, this is um, like a, a little while ago, you mentioned Elon Musk speaking in, in this very specific way. Um, the language of Nick Land lives on right now in Silicon Valley as a sort of techno a techno capital cybernetic libertarianism um it it's everywhere in silicon valley uh it's not hard to find if you know where to look but you won't actually see anyone articulating nick land or philosophy it's all just public policy um you will see you will have a bunch of um there are a bunch of continental philosophers in continental Europe and Russia that are speaking this sort of language of philosophy, but they're not in English. Um, in the Anglosphere, it's pretty sparse everywhere except for in Silicon Valley or hubs of tech. Oh, I'm just on their site right now. This is where I know this place from because Cormac McCarthy kind of lives and works there, I think. I think the author, because I remember seeing an interview with him and, and I'm reading that he's he sets up shop at the Santa Fe Institute, I think. That's just an aside. That's nothing to well, do I, with I don't want to make it into the next like Tavistock Institute sort of meme, but um, there are a million different NGOs like this that parse through metadata that they collect. What do people... What do people click on on the internet? How does this reflect how they will act? What is the predictive power of of these various phenomena? These various phenomena, and how can we fully realize them and market them and make them more efficient and stable and productive? Um, unfortunately, 
there's the real fact that Silicon Valley is an ivory ta- is an ivory tower, and all this wonky language doesn't solve the the hard problem of uh, homeless people defecating on the the streets right outside of Google headquarters. Um, so you have a sort of late stage Rome issue, where you have you know, dreams of a techno capital empire and gray goo expanding into the cosmos. But at your very feet, you're running out of biocapital very quickly, and you're shredding all forms of social capital, you know, trust between people. That's very interesting because I was about to ask, uh, for example, this, let's use Santa Fe Institute as an example. Like I was The follow-up question was going to be what sort of pressure can they put on policymakers or do you use, even though they are, it's sort of a hub of this type of thought, does it, and while even though it's in Silicon Valley, does it seem to have repercussions in everyone's day to day lives? Oh, of course it does. Um, like the sort of data parsing that is being developed in Silicon Valley goes into how the housing market is managed, how you know BlackRock actually acquires houses or sells houses, what businesses do they invest in? Um, like when you read Land and he describes how how ideas of patriarchal genealogy, how sedentary identity, how forms of how crude forms of slavery uh, enchain capital from being their most productive. You can see a whole lot of uh, social credit score systems being molded into this this frame where techno capital knows no boundaries and it must break all all boundaries. It talks about how hot cultures are how hot cultures must be shredded. Could could you uh, dive into that just a bit? Hot cultures you had said? Uh, okay, so so hot cultures so Nick Land says hot cultures tend to social dis- dissolution. They're innovative and adaptive. They always trash and recycle cold cultures. Primitive models have no subversive use. Um, so for some people um, who are wondering, we kind of covered this when we covered the book Free Trade Doesn't Work and discussing sort of an advanced manufacturing society versus a civilization or a country that just produces commodities or resources or just pulls things out of the ground to sell it versus the people they ship those commodities and resources to. Sorry. So what this means is that like I mentioned, or, or we discussed IQ shredders earlier. So cold cultures are essentially these these ivory towers of of capital and markets. They take in hot cultures, hot and dynamic, primitive cultures, and they shred them uh, for all that they're worth. They take you know local customs, local plants, local. Uh, local resources, pretty much everything. And they introduce them to the new market. They boost the market by introducing new resources, knowledge, and products. And then then they then essentially these isolated islands and primitive cultures are functionally assimilated into the global market. So it's it's sort of like a Borg almost. You know, it's amusing. Another example of that, uh, and this is probably going to date me, but uh, there's this old comic book series called Transmetropolitan. And uh, it was very, very popular. It kind of had like a Hunter S. Thompson main character, but it's set in the future. And it's a future very, very much like this. And it's sort of like a British black comedy uh, type, you know, type of humor. But one example was they discover... You know, the problem is humans keep discovering advanced alien species and advanced alien species kind of immigrate to Earth. And then they they do exactly what you said, like they kind of churn through them. They adopt their millennia old culture, make them into a fad, and then they're just kind of sludged by the end of it, you know, and they just keep finding new ones. Yeah, that's exactly what Nick Land is trying to say. 
but he doesn't say that it stops at culture or resources. He says that it will go down into marketable genetics and biology and get extremely personal in the long run. Uh, which be, which is where he starts going into speculative fiction. You know, okay, okay, so what does the market Grey Goo look like in 100 years? And it looks like what you'd imagine San Francisco is going to look like in 10 years. Hmm. Um, so I'm trying to pull up the, um, the specific... The specific um, piece of text, uh, he says, uh, it? call it Los Angeles, government is rotted to its core with narco-capital and collapsing messily. Um, where is it? There's a, there's a link, there, there's a quote where he talks about how you, how the people of the future will tinker with DNA they are going to be these transsexual Latino Chinese uh, drug addicts who are just looking to to expand their genome by any ways necessary. You know, biohazard, bugs in the system, paranoid. It's it's very it is speculative fiction, but it might be our future. Yeah, and for people to know, um, I'm looking at Fang Numena right now. We talk about the the essay Meltdown. Uh, right after Meltdown, there's a, a piece called A Zygothic Excoda, and it's all just like numbers, symbols, weird shit. Like he go, I know this is sort of like mid level land, but for people who are curious, like he really, really does get into just almost free form experimentation arguably poetry in some of it um and he kind of slips in and out of narrative styles so i find that stuff interesting if uh, you know sometimes i got a bit of a critique on his writing style because you know if you're going to enter into the the area of speculative fiction the standards are pretty high so you know sometimes i just don't like it but oh he, he has this quote here meltdown has a place for you as a schizophrenic hiv positive transsexual Chinese Latino stim addicted LA hooker with implanted micro shades and a bad attitude. <laughs> Let's on a poly drug mix of K Nova synthetic serotonin and female orgasm analogs. You have just iced three turn cops with a highly cinematic nine uh, millimeter automatic. So he's describing uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, and that's that's where some of the fun comes in. And you can deal with these extremely. And what's interesting about I guess once I read this stuff, and I just had that for people who are wondering, um, I'm gonna have that uh, quote here. Neo China arrives from the future. Hypersynthetic drugs click into digital voodoo, retro disease, nanospasm, beyond the judgment of God, meltdown. A planetary China syndrome, dissolution of the biosphere into the tectosphere, terminal, terminal speculative bubble crisis, ultravirus, and revolution stripped of all Christian socialist eschatology. Eschatology. So, eschatology, yes. And when I read that, I'm wondering, and this is where we have to speculate. I'd love to have Nick Land on if we could, but he's kind of hard to get a hold of. But let's speculate for a minute because... Like we said, it's not really a philosophy. It's not really an ideology. It kind of exists in this this new space, or I would argue almost an unprecedented intellectual space. And I have to wonder, like, what do you think that him and perhaps his contemporaries are trying to accomplish by writing this stuff? It's not, is it really, is it to gather people? Because he doesn't seem to want to be popular either. Well, this reads like slam poetry, but if you really break down what it's trying to say in each piece it's it's filled with warnings okay so so the dissolution of the biosphere into the technosphere so we want we went over this the dissolution of human peer-to-peer -peer bonds into commercial transactions terminal speculative bubble crisis so gdp housing prices must go up forever um 
wealth must build upon wealth. Uh, revolution stripped of all Christian socialist eschatology down to its burn core of crashed security. So what does it mean by Christian socialist eschatology? So if you've read someone like Curtis Yarvin and his um, and heard his uh, ultra Calvinist hypothesis. Um, it is the idea that these Renaissance ideas of humanism and enlightenment eventually transform into into the the philosophy and logic of markets, completely stripped down and removed. Uh, so what you have are old school Christian socialist philosophies stripped down to nothing but markets. Like originally these ideas had Christ at the center of them, but they've been stripped down and all that exists now is crashed security. So fix the crisis of low trust between human, pe human beings. Um, so each of these does have a very specific place uh, and a very specific warning and a very spooky prediction attached to each of these, but it reads like slam poetry and you actually have to get brain trauma and read a bunch <laughs> of, of books and listen to MIT lectures to understand it. Um, just on that point, I know this is a big question, so feel free to tell me to go fuck myself. But are there any other references or sources that you would recommend people get into if they like this sort of thing? We kind of touched on the Santa Fe Institute. Then they got a lot of articles and studies on there. But is there anything else? So uh, one of the references that I made previously were K-lines. Uh, and these come from uh, Marvin Minsky's lectures called The Society of Mind. Just to, I got that book. I got it like this week, and I was going to dive into that in the show in the future too. But keep going. Yeah. So so Land will just drop hints that he's he's listened or read listened to these lectures or read these uh, books, but he won't actually spell it out for you. Uh, so it's it's that obscurantism. But if you've been initiated into uh, into deeper philosophy, you'll understand where it's coming from. Um, yeah, so and that, also just that point, mm -hmm. his early stuff was mostly talking about Immanuel Kant, right? Or am I wrong on that? Because I remember that from Fang Numena as well, a lot of Kant stuff. Yeah, he's, well, Fang Numena is in itself a very hard to explain uh, pun. <laughs> uh, for neo-Kantian philosophy. I don't think I could explain it myself, uh, but it's something like uh, the Leviathan of logic emerging out of irrationality as a, as phenomenon. I it's it's hard to explain, but if, if well, I, I had if, if I had like several paragraphs of, of blog like if I had a few pages of blogs um, like written out, I could probably get close to explaining it. It's something oh, no, it's, like it, it's, it's okay if you, if you don't want to, too, because if you if you're going to get yourself into a hole on this one, I don't want to push you in. Mm -hmm. um, it's something like it's something like the logic of the future, the idealized future, birthing itself. Um, okay. It's it's hard to explain, uh, and I didn't quite prepare for that part. No, no, no. Don't worry about it, because mm -hmm. I was just trying to give people the context of sort of as you're following. What's interesting is when I talk about his work is you have to, like you we were saying earlier at the beginning, like chart a course through these different phases as well, right up until the, the modern day. And um, before, I don't want to branch off too much here, but I was going to ask you, um, if a if you follow if you follow him very closely still, and b if you think his current work or his current uh, thought process is similar to this, or if it's evolved in a different direction, I actually haven't read a single one of his Substacks. 
Uh, I think <laughs> me neither. Well, well, it's mostly about Bitcoin, and you have to be in a very specific sphere and mood to actually dive into it. And I enjoyed his um, his his internet Twitter like shenanigans. Um, so he he is actually he does actually hint at how how the proper way to approach his, him is not philosophy. He does say that you know philosophy is uh, it's just is philosophy or is just um, despotic, platonic, fascistic, top-down solutions that always screw up viciously. You know, he prefers schizoanalysis. You know, just yes, avoid, yes. A- avoid ideas, stick to diaphragms of uh, software and logic and circuitry. I was going to ask you about schizoanalysis um, because in the book, there is an essay later on. It's uh, mm-hmm. actually not so much an essay as it is an interview uh, with another uh, professor at the university he was working at. I'm trying to find it here, what it's called. Jesus Christ, I should have bookmarks. What What are you, some kind of fucking podcast host? Uh, is it Barker Speaks? I think it's called Barker. Hold on. Yeah, Barker Speaks, the interview with Professor D.C. Barker. And this is the first one I remember seeing the term schizoanalysis and my recollection of it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it was something they, the example they gave was how would you know an alien communication in space if you saw it? Because we are so used to communication working a certain way, very linearly, beginning, middle, and end. And we oftentimes structure, even across cultures, our, our in, information processing the exact same way, almost temporally. And they had said, you have to break out of that paradigm and think of how communication can exist in a non-linear state kind of like a schizophrenic mind versus you know a healthy mind is is that any of that sound right or am i way off that sounds like the plot of the movie arrival starring amy yeah Adams. yeah um, yeah but nick land does actually have an entire philosophy of time and it involves Bitcoin solving the time space problem. And it's it's a it's a headache that I haven't been able to work <laughs> my way through quite yet. Um, That's a lot I mean, to put on Bitcoin too. I mean he he does say stuff like garbage time is running out in meltdown, but you know, it it's just another like do I really have to spend another six hours on YouTube? listening to MIT lectures just to get this like <laughs> one reference. And the answer is, you know, all right, let's Google what garbage time is. Let's find out what it is. <laughs> or like what, specu- like what speculative cyber, like science fiction book do I have to understand to, do I have to read to, to understand what level two, level one, level two. Actually, I know what those are. Those are just, those are um, as Asimov's um, planetary scales, you know. Um, all right, so you have to you have to be a fan of classical and contemporary science fiction to understand Meltdown. Um, I'm trying to. I'm just scrolling through Meltdown to see if I can find a proper example, but I don't know what garbage time is. I'm sure if I <laughs> hit my head against a wall a few times and and Googled around, I could find out. But um, but that's what makes Land interesting. He's a puzzle. They can spend hours on a Saturday just trying to figure out. Um, you could do that, and then you could actually read his well written, like more lucid. Uh, prose because he can actually write um like geo and uh, the prudentialist have been covering uh, xeno systems which usually is much more lucid and short and quippy and explanatory and you know a whole lot better than the slam poetry of meltdown but you know where's the fun in um in reading a few paragraphs of uh of clear and concise philosophy when you could just dive into this schizophrenic mess yeah Um, 
I think that's what makes it so attractive too. And would you say, first of all, would you say that you are, this is probably a dumb way to say it, but a fan of Nick Land at this point in time? Well, I'd say I'm an admirer. I won't say that I'm a fan. Um, what happened was with the sort of NRX revivalism was that a near reaction as a sort of blogosphere existed somewhere between maybe like 2007 and 2013, 14-ish. But then it died hard when when MAGA came around and the OG alt-right and Don, the election of Donald Trump happened and there was a wave of populism that of populism, of very materialist base, um, po- uh, pragmatic politics, erased very highfalutin, obscurantist, entryist, NRX philosophy. Uh, and for a few years, you had alt right stuff all over, all over the place. But then YouTube started banning the OG content creators and left a hole in the market, and the failures of populism gave way to more speculative and highfalutin explanations, which is where the the videos of of, uh, Distributist and Charlemagne came along, where you had figures like Curtis Yarvin explaining, you know, come on guys, like populism, we've we've tried this before, here are some of the techno-capital solutions. And it's incredibly hard to process these solutions. It's hard to get into land, but you know, try as we did, we started mining those books um, around um, around 2018, and uh, there was a sort of NRX revivalist period that I hopefully contributed a little bit to in the conversation. Uh, better minds than me have have covered land, uh, but I I do believe he has a lot of insights that we could actually could actually derive uh, derive some um, some help from. Well, that's what we've been trying to do on the show as well. And for we mentioned very briefly uh, the show Content Minded by uh, two people who've been on the show before, the Prudentialist and Geo. Some people go check that out. They cover Xeno Systems, uh, which is Nick Land's writings. And they they probably, you know, these are guys doing nine hour streams. They probably go through all of it, I'm sure. Me, me old chunk of coal, you're not going to get me to talk more than 20 minutes about anything. That's why we're about to talk about pretzels. But uh, <laughs> um, What's interesting is about Nick Land, about this sort of NRX revival. This is something actually we're trying to do on the show, which is sort of sort through these old, not even that old. That's a, I use that term loosely, but you know things that I think deserve a second look. And that's why when we looked at Nick Land, I, I'm looking. I'm like, there's a lot of really really interesting stuff here. There's some stuff I don't like. And I bet there's a lot of people listening who might say, who might describe this as fatalistic. That you know, I don't, I don't like this sort of techno inevitability. But you know, it, there's still good stuff in here. And I think what had happened was, you know, to my view anyway, NRX got dominated by uh, Curtis Yarvin, and he's he's sort of he's kind of the king of that stuff now, for better or worse. Nick Land's kind of receded away from that. But um, do do you think that? Uh, you know, not to disparage him, do you think there's still some people like Yarvin who are trying to still forward that movement in a good way? If I remember correctly, Yarvin has said that he's never read a single page of Land's work. Ah. So, um, what I, I think happened was it takes a very special type of autistic person to read Land. Like much less actually espouse, like some sort of praxis that that you know comes out of it. Um, usually, when I have people come to me in my DMs and say, "Hey, like I'm a fan of Lands," um, you know, I go to their Twitter and it sounds like schizophrenic nonsense. <laughs> um, so that is an immediate turnoff. And probably rightfully so. 
Uh, and just before you continue, of- Nick Land had a, a tweet one time where he was kind of making a joke. He says someone wrote him a letter. I'm a huge fan of your work. And he says he immediately deletes it for clear signs of mental illness. Yeah, I don't think like, it's it's very, very difficult to effectively mine his his work for digestible digestible content unless you're very clued in on on very specific niche like talking points and ways of thinking. Um, so it's not for mass. Com- I don't believe it's for mass consumption, um, but for the few autistic people out there who want to try to make heads or tails out of it, um, you know, there is some stuff that you can, can get out of it. For those autistic people out there, for those vanguardist few who are, who dive into this, who really take it apart and find the useful stuff in there. And again, this might be a big question. So again, feel free to tell me to go fuck myself, but what would you recommend the people who are interested in this stuff do? You know, for example, some people go to Silicon Valley and actually try and action this stuff in policy. But what do you think the way forward is for the people who like this stuff and maybe are not so interested in, let's say the classical nationalist scene or, you know, the familiar stuff. Um, are you looking for for his more digestible works, or are you I, looking as, more for? I, I mean, people like yourself, people who've been around the block, people who you know, you look around and you might see the same tired discussions, the same conversations happening over and over again. And, you know, it's like someone like Nick Land would say, or you know, Curtis Yarvin would say, look, we tried populism, populism didn't work, yet there's still people out there ringing the bell of populism. But I was just trying to say, like, what is, for someone like yourself, maybe even myself, who are, who kind of tap into this weirder, more fringe stuff, what do you think they should do politically or, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to see, like, what the way forward for people like so- this is. So one of my, one of the good lessons of land is that the frame is not necessarily left or right or uh, capitalist versus socialist. It's capitalist versus idiocy. Um, hmm. And so if you actually look at how, how larger corporations make their decisions through aggr- aggravated data, aggregated data, and how Silicon Valley actually views the world. It, if you're a coder or a computer scientist, I think you will find some answers or a better way of looking at the world and better frame uh, in looking and learning from land. I'm not exactly sure what you can actually do with this, though. Like It's incredibly... It's incredibly dense. It, the best, it, the best, something like meltdown could do for a person is to provide a frame or a way of looking at the world. I'm not sure exactly what you do with it, and I think that's what the main problem of NRX was. It is a whole lot of thinking, but it's very difficult to suss out what you actually could do in terms of policy. Like, are you going to become some sort of like rogue hacktivist? <laughs> like a uh, anonymous type who um, who takes down the system or creates alternative systems of data management on a new internet, something or another. I don't know. I'm not a programmer, so this is just beyond me. Yeah, w- one thing I I keep running over my head as we're talking is the idea of human capital. We talk about the IQ shredder. We talk about you know, at the center of this thing being this sort of race against dysgenics. And, you know, I just had one thought of (laughs) um, in the future as high IQ people or, you know, genetically not insane. Because when we talk about, you know, eugenics, you know, it's not just IQ. It's also maladaptive characteristics across the board. It could be various mental illnesses tied to IQ, obviously. But, you know, I had this idea of someone an individual kind of stockpiling a Noah's Ark of, of adaptive genetic material and holding that as the ultimate human capital, something like Gattaca or something where you've got like the DNA or the genetic code or the sperm or something of like the last smart people on earth. 
And it's like, well, what are we going to do with it? You know? Well, you shred it and you turn it into money and capital. Like that's the, that's the future that land envisions. Like, and what he has is what he articulates is unconstrained accelerationism. Uh, so that's, no, this is a, a politics free, like judgment free, like process that will happen with or without, with or without your input. It just is. And I also, I wonder, is there a way to do brain drain without having an IQ shredder? Like if, if we remove the, the, the urban living that seems to shred it, is there a way to centralize all of the high IQ people and not shred them? Well, how do you, <laughs> um, I know it's a big, weird question, of course. So, but I'm just so that's actually something a person like Edward Dutton would actually come up with a solution for. Um, the solution is a return to Darwinian eugenics um, in the long run. Uh, so essentially the, the future as predicted by Edward Dutton is that we've been living in peaceful, high trust, high wealth civilization for too long. Eventually we will return to harsh Darwinian selection after the spiteful mutants have shredded all of the, the actual capital that we have accumulated over the last 200 years. Um, so the solution to the IQ shredder is essentially a return to barbarism and high infant mortality rates and robots doing all sorts of weird uh, prenatal shenanigans. Um, so it's a mix of, of hard Darwinian conditions on the ground, plus robots doing all sorts of bizarre things to increase and perfect fertility um, that's kind of what i was thinking of that because we had covered edward dutton's spiteful mutants book maybe a few weeks ago and we're, we're great fans of that book and i i've spoken to him a couple of times before but yeah he takes a very he as we discussed in the clip he discusses adaptive and maladaptive characteristics and he was very charitable to uh, religion i thought more than i thought someone of his mind would be but uh, i i do wonder and again, I'm not trying to make this into like an ethno-nationalist thing, but I'm wondering like when you hear Nick Land talk about it, he talks about in terms of humanity versus, you know, maybe it is just the West that pursues this. You know, if there is sort of a breakdown and that for whatever reason we kind of we cut off the rest of the world, it, maybe it's just North America that really pursues all this crazy stuff. And then it's like a tiered planet in that sense does that make any sense or what do you think well his like land's prediction is that diversity is called uh, diversity is coming for any hub of techno capital and wealth in the long run like yes you can create uh, he calls them turing police so it's it's democratic politics trying to keep out invasive markets um uh, and in the long run, they fail or they will become like either they will fail or they become very harsh third world slums to be farmed for their uh, for their bio capital substrata. So what I mean is um, uh, Lynn actually gets into it in um, Can't Can't Capital and the Prohibition of Incest, where he articulates that the third world is like nations in the third world are bantu stands for wealth <laughs> extraction and high IQ extraction um, that are far enough for us to kind of forget about, but we can still reap the rewards of having mercantile colonies um, plus a little bit of diversity uh, like high IQ diversity that is. But he talks about how in the future, techno capital will erode borders in the long run. And, mm. and when that happens, you better pray to God that the 
hyperintelligent AI has solved the crime problem. <laughs> That's an interesting one because I I kind of get you know people look at me crazy when I talk about this stuff too about talking about unprecedented solutions and that's you know the core of what I like about Nick Land and people like him is that again even if I don't agree with everything they say it seems that they're seeking out unprecedented solutions for unprecedented future because the future is always unprecedented and if we look at all of the kind of inputs and the precedence that we do have like the future looks pretty fucking crazy so we need people who are talking kind of crazy to maybe prepare for what might happen and you know think thinking of ways that ai can solve crime i think is one way something i would love to talk about to anyone who wants to talk about it frankly well i guess the closest that thing that we have to that was in america the Giuliani administration cleaning up New York City um, and effectively turning it into sort of Disney-fied, like, large-scale ad space. Like, uh, if anyone remembers how bad New York City was in the, the 70s and 80s, there was a crime-ridden hellhole, and, and it took, you know, stop and frisk and... Um, was the word like broken window policing? Yeah, yeah it's a broken window policy that broken people still com- they still complain about that to this day. But it seemed and and there's a lot of people on the left and liberals who will push back and say it accomplished nothing. My reading of the data said quite the opposite. But you know, yeah, it definitely it definitely did. Uh, but in terms of capital solutions to low social trust, you know, look at China. Like, look at what they do for monitoring people with God knows how many cameras everywhere and social credit to cover up the actual cultural failings of the Chinese people um, and their inability to ke- to take care of each other. Um, replace social capital with, with actual capital. Like, okay, so you can't actually shame people into taking care of each other. Might as well attach it to their credit score. Uh, to to sort of gamify it. Um, unfortunately, places like the UK have more cameras per capita than China, but they're still messes. <laughs> um, True. And they're still not able to actually um, run their their country effect or police their country effectively. Um, so that's where gonna... new China comes from. The future comes from. Like they have technological solutions to the low trust problem that we are not equipped to handle at the moment because we have politics in the way. Yeah. And what's interesting is with the case of China, this is coming from the you know central committee and everything. And I was, whenever I hear people talk about this, it seems to be coming from private interest and from Silicon Valley. Does that sound like an accurate assessment that, cause I'm trying to think of, in the if this future is happening, who is kind of at the pilot seat of that? And to me, it seems like, at least in the West, it's private corporations. Would that be accurate? So this is where something. This was this is where Land and Yarvin and NRX and and me personally diverge, um, partly because. Like as a wasp, you read American political history or the history of wasp political economy in America. And we tended to, to thrive and do do our best when we had a very democratic means of accountability. Uh, like we had conventions and initiatives for just about everything. Like you had we had incredibly high trust very politically active communities that solved problems without without no computer behind the screen. Um, what Land and Yervin point to in America <clears throat> is the fact that we have so many so many entities, so many democratic me so many democratic structures in the way of good policing essentially, 
like if we did set up security cameras on every main street and if we did actually i mean we already do have cameras on just about every main street like if you go to any american states uh, department of transportation website you can actually see the live like a live feed of every every traffic camera in your state like they are actually live mm -hmm. but if you you know made it crime stopping uh, machine empowered some AI to actually eliminate crime, you could do that. But, you know, there go any sort of democratic, like there goes democracy, there goes civil liberties, there goes uh, any sort of social capital, social capital or, so, or social responsibility. Um, so what America has are what America has is an industry dedicated to techno capital, you know, the finest in the world, where we import all of the greatest um, minds of the world to work in our companies. But we also have the most low tech, low level um, social enforcement mechanisms. Uh, so we have the best technology, but we don't actually use it. In fact, we're completely opposed to it. In a lot of places hmm. so that's where something like neo china comes to the future comes from where he envisions a much more futurist country coming in and replacing the united states in terms some, of technology would anything like you know for example i know people bring this up a lot but the world economic forum any of these supranational entities sometimes they're ngos sometimes there's something else think tanks and just kind of these shadow organizations you always hear about do they have a role to play in any of this because a lot of the t talk seems to still think of things in terms of nations as well i mean we could just go on to the to a rant about um what's that one movie uh network uh where yeah, yeah. What's his name? Warren Beatty is is beaten down by the corporate CEO who says, you know, there are no more nations, there are no peoples, no more ideologies. There's just money in a very cynical dressing down of a of a TV prophet of the idealist, yeah, of the idealist, yeah. I think that's that's the sort of embodiment of what Land is getting after is go, is going after. Um. So I'm not exactly sure where you, where you, where you go with this. No, that's good because we, we covered everything I also wanted to cover as well and then some. And I guess – and we, we could end it uh, in just a few minutes, but I guess I just wanted to um, – from your perspective and, and you, you're coming up to the scene and you having studied all this stuff, are you – at all optimistic when you survey this this thing of ours, this scene, what everyone called the dissident right. Um, are you optimistic about where it's going or any work being done in that? Um, on the so-called dissident right? Yeah. I, I believe that I've always hated that term. I've always heard, I've always thought the word distant sounded very dorky. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, you, it lends to like permanent rebellion, which is the opposite of what most people want on this side too. Let's I, I just don't care for the term. Um, what it effectively was, was the skeleton of the alt-right whose meat was, was blown off of its skeleton. What you have left is the skeleton of the old alt-right in the distant right plus a lot of the people who were not were not offensive or edgy or controversial enough to have made it onto the original alt-right. Um, so a lot of people online will complain that the DR does not have any muscles, and I'd say that the muscles have been blown clean off of the body because of a, of a nuking off of Twitter or a nuking off of YouTube or doxing or burnout um but in general i'm actually somewhat optimistic for a few different reasons um i think the mimetic pressure is actually on the side of the right because 
by Silicon Valley's own metrics, they haven't been able to stop uh, incidences of, uh, of hate speech or you know, controversial trolling online, even with the most, um, the most intense censorship that they could actually throw at us. Uh, in spite of all of the censorship, we have an ecosystem of alt tech where we can still talk to each other. We have an ecosystem of spreading memes all over the place and ideas all over the place, even if they try to nuke us. Um, in nuking a bunch of the more overt, uh, offensive accounts, what they what Silicon Valley has effective, effectively done is... If you're familiar with the concept of superbugs, um, whenever you wash your hands and apply soap, you kill 99% of the germs, but the 1% that survives is resistant to soap. So on Twitter, what you what they've effectively done is moderated out all of the, the weaker memes, and now you have completely uncensorable Q memes and patriot memes and boomer tier k lines <laughs> that that are uncensorable and unconstrained and they can't seem to stop them um so so there is some there is some room for optimism even if you know you can't post the most offensive things on online anymore yeah one thing i'll say is we discussed this very briefly before we started and uh i kind of make mention of this now and again on the show um, and I'm careful not to, you know, put too much information out there because I don't want to dox myself. So people are going to have to trust me or don't. I don't give a shit. But um, fr- sort of the inside baseball of what's going on with the NGOs that I've had contact with at various levels. Some of them are very, very concerned with online discourse of the right and stuff. And I'm just going to say from the various NGOs and think tanks that I've heard from, there is a pronounced panic that they actually don't know what's going on with the right. <laughs> they're they're using very antiquated terms, their understanding of what's going on. You know, we always joke about how we're being watched by feds and they're, you know, sometimes maybe like the FBI, but for the people like the policymakers, they're they're sweating that they can't they can't make sense of what this thing called the right is talking about anymore the memes don't make sense to them they they their their finger is so far off the pulse of what we're doing so they're panicking and they're trying to you know deal with a pretty broad brush but it's very inelegantly done and that makes me happy that we have become sort of mimetic super bugs um, so so one sorry. of the the downturn or like one of the downsides of this is the fact that what we have are two two and a half generations of of always online antisocial trolls that have been mimetically trained to evade evasion and censorship. Uh, so yeah, you won't get banned, or yeah, you found workarounds, but at the same time, you're always online. You're you're over socialized. You're like underperforming in real life, and you have nothing to lose, and you're effectively a less valuable person IRL, hmm. um, or at least that's the that's the way like the millennials and Zoomers and Gen, Gen Alpha appear. Like we've had all of our dopamine receptors burned out. So now what? Um, yeah, we can escape evasion and spread memes, but meat space doesn't look too great. You know, I got one thing, a thought occurred, and uh, and we can get going after this because I know it's probably pretty late and I got to get going. Um, but when we talk about land, something that we just discussed was how land isn't really trying to speak to everyone. In fact, him and a lot of the NRX guys were scoffing at the idea of populism. And what I find is even on the current right, there's still an obsession with populism. And I'm as guilty of this as anyone. I'm always trying to reach the normie. I'm always trying to broadcast more, get a bigger audience and more reach. But I think now 
and I'm going to try and say this in a way where it doesn't sound just retarded, but I'm trying to think of if there's a way going forward for the, the intellectuals, you know, the influencers, whatever, the people making content on the right to do it in a non-populist way and more like land. Like we, what is there a way to craft content, not for popularity or populist appeal, but to speak to, policy makers kind of like what land and a lot of these others are trying to do the, the people the think tanks the people within arm's reach of the levers of power you know in marketing we would call this a b2b model not a b2c model b2c would be a business of consumer we're actually trying to talk to other people who are kind of making content as well rather than try and be like stand-up comedians or something does that make any sense or am i just you're, you're this- looking for a good call to action and I'd say that that political parties, you know, left and right, they always need autistic programmers who read about techno capital and land uh, to actually make their campaigning better and to make better informed policy decisions. Um, so I'd say that if you look for, like, if you look hard enough, you can find good policy think tanks that could use good programmers. Um, so I just say, you know, if you're autistic, you know, keep doing what you're doing, but hopefully do it in the right direction. I think and that's it, a good as place to end mm-hmm. as any, actually. Um, I just want to say, uh, if, if it, that's all you had to say, cause that's all everything I wanted to cover. Did you have uh, any last words on uh, Mr. Land or the future? On land in the future, I think if you revisit what he said in the 1990s in his essays, they come true more and more each day, especially the more cyberpunky, uh, cyberpunky elements of it. Like, if you look at how and why the original cyberpunk um, future envisioned came about and then died off. It came about at the birth of the internet and then died once there was a longing for something more human. Like, of course, um, you can look at something like Billy Idol's disastrous album, Cyberpunk, (laughs) where, you know, he's singing about the LA riots, but in the frame of cyberpunk and it did not actually make much sense in meat space, so to speak. Like you can't actually apply the language of land to contemporary issues. All you can really use it is as a frame to understand how things will continuously become more, more, You will have much more information overload in the future. Wealth and financial crises will get worse in the future. Uh, Peer-to-peer human systems will be phased out in favor of much more techno-commercial almost services in a sort of new feudal way, as Keith Woods calls them. and the way through this is not, as Nick Land says, platonic fascist top-down solutions. They will always screw up. But the only way forward is to actually master the data and master the actual, uh, the actual phenomenon and, and data as they actually emerge. Um, so that's, that's where Land is. It's probably just a bunch of gobbledygook, but no, no. That's um, I think I think that's the best summary I've heard of. You know, if if it is possible to summarize someone's entire output like that, but that I think frames it perfectly well. So on that note, what I'm going to do is I'm going to direct people back to Mr. Clossington here. Check him out on YouTube under Clossington C L O S S I N G. T-O-N. Uh, he's got a lot of great videos on there. And then the, it, it was the uh, Old Glory was the sub stack to keep an Old eye Old Glory for. Club. It's a, a YouTube Glory channel Club. and uh, sub stack, but it will produce a whole lot more projects in the future. 
in terms of uh, IRL events, IRL startups, you name it. It's coming, it's it's in the pipeline um, and a whole lot of your favorite personalities are going to be in it. Uh, a lot of them are still under wraps, but you'll see a lot of familiar names on November 7th. So uh, look out for that. And uh, I will hopefully come out with two more live streams in the future on my main channel. Um, so so keep, um, keep on subscribing to my channel. And uh, I promise to produce content at some point. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I do have a very active Telegram channel and Discord if you want to go there or get into contact with me. I might be back on Twitter, like God willing, Elon Musk uh, lets me back on. But if I don't, Telegram's the place to find me. Yes. And on Telegram, that's Punished Clossington, I believe it's. Uh, and it's t.me slash it's chossington c-h-o-s-s-i-n-g-t-o-n that's what i know it as anyway yeah uh i i've been banned off of uh, twitter so many times uh one of my reincarnations was as punished clossington and i had like a, a metal gear solid um avatar because i, I felt like I've, I've been punished so many times by twitter i i was like i promised to be a, a good boy but they still nuked my account. So it's very unfortunate. But Give the name's still again. stuck. I just got back on Twitter. And I think if you take it slow, you can kind of sneak by. I've been kind of just easing my follows so I don't cause alarm. All right. So I got to get going. Now, this has been a fantastic conversation. I had a great time. And I hope to talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you soon, soon in the future, Dimes. All right. See you soon. Bye. Do not let the rapists win. Listen and love Blood Satellite.